So we're in chapter 26 of the book of Matthew. And um, as we saw last week, um, Jesus spent Passover with the disciples. And uh, we looked at some of the symbolism that is in the Passover meal and the Passover celebration, the, the Feast of Unleavened Bread, uh, and how that really points to Jesus and what he came here to do. We also got to see him establish the Last Supper, or the Lord's Supper, however you, communion, whatever you call it. He, he took every, the disciples through that in, in uh, verse 26 through 29, I believe, were the verses, and those are the, we're going to go through those this afternoon, or this evening. Uh, hopefully it's not too late if I'm not too long-winded, but um, we're going to take communion together tonight. And it was the, the uh, orig- origination of that institution of, of uh, communion that is there to remind us of the sacrifice that Jesus made for us. Uh, how his body was broken and whipped and beaten. And, and then how he was nailed to the cross. And it was his blood that he shed in his death that covered our sins. And so... He established in his blood a new covenant. And we talked about how it could only have been God that could establish any new covenant with his creation. We ended with the verse 30 where it says, And when they had sung a hymn, uh, they went to the Mount of Olives. And that hymn, you know, we're speaking of the traditional psalms that would be sung at the Passover meal. Uh, it was called the Hallel, uh, Psalms 116 through 118. They're all psalms uh, that are embedded with messages of deliverance, which is why they were sung at Passover. But I'm certain that uh, some of those cries for deliverance were the foreshadowing of the passage that we're going to cover tonight. So after seeing the Hallel, uh, Jesus actually started making his way out to the Mount of Olives. And and I'm going to step into the book of John really quickly just to insert a prayer because all the Gospels, I mean, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, they cover a lot of the same stuff. But the book of John just covered things that the other Gospels didn't. And it's not because they're inaccurate. It's because John was totally focused on the person of Jesus Christ. And so before we jump into chapter, the rest of chapter 26, I just wanted to stop and read this prayer. Because it's a prayer that he doesn't just pray over the disciples. We're not going to read the whole prayer. Uh, But the portion we're going to cover is where he actually prays for you and for me. So I hope as I read this that we are blessed and encouraged by it. In verse 20 of chapter 17 of John, it says, I do not ask for these only, but also for those who will believe in me through their word. That's you and me. And that they may all be one, just as you, Father, are in me and I in you. That they also may be in us, so that the world may believe that you have sent me. The glory that you have given me, and uh, I have given to them. That they may be one, even as we are one. I in them, and you in me. That they may become perfectly one, so that... The world may know that you sent me and love them as you love me. Father, I desire that they also, whom you have given me, may be with me where I am, to see my glory that you have given me because you loved me before the foundation of the world. O righteous Father, Even though the world does not know you, I know you. And these know that you have sent me. I have made made known to them your name, and I will continue to make it known, that the love with which you have loved me may be in them, and I in them. What I love about that prayer is it drives home this fact that this is not about religion. We can, we can talk about people being religious. I am, if I was left to my devices, I would be a religious fisherman. 
love fishing. We're not talking about activities that we can do. We're talking about a relationship. And when he's saying, you and me and I and you and us and them to be perfectly one, why? And so the world can see him through us. And so the love that we learn by learning of him and being taught who he is and abiding in him, that love can pour out on everybody around us. Here's the hard part about that prayer. He prays it, and then he's got some bad news for the disciples. He's already delivered some bad news, and that bad news was that one of them was going to betray him. And we talked through last week how that person was only singled out by his own words. Uh, we, you always read about Jesus saying, well, he dipped, he who is going to betray me will dip his uh, bread in the wine after me. Well, they were all doing that. What he was saying is, this is going to be a friend. This is going to be someone close to me. All the other disciples referred to Jesus as Lord, and, and Judas referred to him as Rabbi. And there's a difference in that relationship. Lord is someone that you place in authority over your life. To be able to say, Lord, whatever you ask of me, I will do. There's authority there. That you, not just, you don't just recognize him as God, but you give him that authority over you to where you live out your life in obedience to him. But a rabbi is just a teacher. And I, shouldn't, I don't mean to discredit that much. But Judas had definitely stopped, for whatever reason, seeing Jesus as his Lord. In verse 31, here comes the next bad news. So then Jesus said to them, You will all fall away because of me this night. For it is written, I will strike the shepherd and the sheep of the flock will be scattered. But after I am raised up, I will go before you to Galilee. Peter answered him, Though they all fall away because of you, I will never fail, fall away. Good old Peter. So here comes this bad news. It was bad enough to know that one of them was going to betray him, but now they're hearing that everybody else is going to fall away. They're going to fall away from him because of their mere association with him, because of the danger attached to their association with him. Their loyalty to him is going to be tested to the utmost degree, and they're all going to fail. Now, I don't know about you, but I, I really wouldn't enjoy getting news like that. Um, but why do you think Jesus told them that? I mean, he could have just let it happen. But I think that, and I think it proves that what he's doing here is he's actually showing them ahead of time, this is what's going to happen. To where when it happened, they would go, oh, man. He said that would happen. Don't know why I'm so messed up tonight. Excuse me. Woo. It's going to be a long night. Oh, I think it's because of the, maybe because of the grief that's in these pages, in these verses. So, I don't know. But we'll see. Hopefully it's not too many tears. He goes on to say, for it is written, I will strike the shepherd and the sheep will, of the flock will be scattered. That's from uh, Zechariah 3, 7, which is, I awake, O sword, o, o, against my shepherd, against the man who stands next to me, declares the Lord of hosts, strike the shepherd and the sheep will be scattered. I will turn my hand against the little ones. So Jesus is referring to that passage here. It's interesting also that in the midst of this bad news, there's good news. In the midst of him saying, you're all going to fall away from me, he's saying, but after I'm raised up. He's not saying I'm going to die and, well, see you later. He's reminding them of the time and time again where he said, I'm going to go to Jerusalem, I'm going to be put on a cross, I'm going to die, and I'm going to be raised again on the third day. He's been telling them that. And so now he's even talking to them about the, the joyous time that they're going to be reunited with him. After they fall away, after he's crucified, 
they're going to meet him again. And it's not just meet him again down the street from where the cross was. They're meeting him back home. He said, I will go before you to Galilee. The place where they spent two-thirds of their ministry. The place where they got to see him walk on water. The place where they got to see him heal countless people. They know, or they're being told in the midst of this sad news, that there's going to be a day that they'll be reunited. Peter, in true Peter form, I mean, I don't know if it's just for namesake, but I, I find myself relating to him so much. Um, I don't know, I hate admitting that I'm wrong, right? Anybody else struggle with that? I, I hate being told that you're going to, if you don't do it right, you're going to mess up. I don't know how I would have reacted in this, but I think, I, I mean, it's, it's Peter that Jesus came along and said, uh, on this rock I will build my church, you know? Peter's the one that declared, you're the Christ, the Son of the living God first. I mean, Peter was determined, Peter was brave, he, was, he would not shrink back from anything. How in the world would I ever fall away from you? He says, though they, so he's like throwing the other ten under the bus. Remember, because Judas is gone. Judas is off getting his money and about ready to come in um, to the scene. He says, not me. They might do that, Lord, but not me. I will never fall away. It's interesting, uh, as we go through our lives, um, especially in America, I think things are just, I think, so comfortable in America. I mean, we, may, we have difficulties, and we just heard a whole bunch of prayer requests, right? Not everything's just peachy keen all the time. But um, oftentimes, we see hard things, and we want to point at a person or a situation or a circumstance and go, well, that stinks, and that, I don't like that person. And we just, we forget that there is a spiritual battle going on all around us. I mean, just getting here tonight, there, there could have been fights that happened in the cars. I know as soon as Wednesday or Sunday is rolling around, Satan is stirring the pot at my house. Because he doesn't want Joanne and I doing well when we get here. Right? Because then we could accomplish a whole lot for the kingdom. And so it's important for us to understand that. And the reason I bring that up is because in Luke 22... After Peter says that he will not fall away, Jesus says this to him in verse 31 and 32. Simon, Simon, behold, Satan demanded to have you that he might sift you like wheat. But I have prayed for you that your faith may not fail. And when you have turned again, strengthen your brothers. Jesus is saying, Peter, you forget that there is a spiritual battle going on out there. The devil actually, he demanded to have you. The tests that we have in our lives, the trials that we have come up in our lives, they're all a test of our faith. It's not, you're not just have a, a string of bad luck if things, it's just one thing after another. What the Bible says is that we should um, expect these things and we should see them for what they are. They're a trial, they're a test for our faith. And that we shouldn't shrink back from it, we should actually press into it so that we would learn perseverance. Because perseverance, when we let it run its full course, brings about completeness in us. Ready for anything that might come at us. That's the Peter paraphrase translation. Here he's saying, Satan, I allowed Satan to test you. That he might sift you like wheat, but I prayed for you that your faith would not fail. But look at the last part of verse 32 again. And when you have turned again, as we'll discover, as we keep reading in the Gospels, Peter denies Christ three times. I don't think I'm spoiling anything here. I think we know that story, hopefully, pretty good. But when the resurrection happens, Jesus actually says, go get the disciples and Peter. And it just points to the fact that Peter was not with the disciples. 
So when you have turned again, strengthen your brothers. Let's keep reading in, in 26, verse 34. Jesus said, and this is after telling him that he would fall away, and Peter kind of pushing back a little bit. He says, truly I tell you, this very night, before the rooster crows, you will deny me three times. Peter said to him, even if I must die with you, I will not deny you. And then all the disciples said the same. I think we bag on Peter pretty good for being the guy that denied him three times. But here, all of the disciples say, we won't fall away, we won't deny you. And they, and they all fall away. Peter, Peter is reassured by Jesus, but not just reassured that it's actually going to happen, he gives him a timeline. Before the rooster crows, you'll deny me three times. I think as we read through this passage, it can be so familiar to us that we could just kind of read through it and, well, there's that great, you know, talk between Jesus and the disciples again. And we, we might miss the fact that in these pages, it is a reminder that Jesus knows you better than you know yourself. No matter how strong you think you might be, Jesus knows our heart. In some of the hardest times that I've had in ministry, I've had to ask him because I doubted myself. I doubt, and I just wanted to make sure that, that there wasn't anything bad in me. Or if there was, please expose it, right? We can't just go through life assuming that because we have the Holy Spirit living in us as believers that we're just going to get it right all the time. I was just talking to somebody earlier about they just felt like they were filled with the Spirit. And it's like the Spirit's always there, but we, we need to invite Him in to, to minister to us and to our hearts and our minds all throughout the day. Take control of it all because left up to my own devices in my flesh, I'm going to fail. And so what you see in this is the God of the universe who created you in his image, who knit you together in your mother's womb, who knows how many hairs you have on your head, even for those of us who either shave them or, you know, don't have as many. He knows how many hairs you have and he knows us. And this goes, so this just goes so far beyond religion. It's just not about religion. It's about a relationship. Verse 36. It says, Then Jesus went with them. So they're, they're, leaving, um, they're leaving Jerusalem and they're going toward the Garden of Gethsemane. And then Jesus went with them to a place called Gethsemane and he said to his disciples, Sit here while I go over there and pray. And taking with him Peter and the two sons of Zebedee, he began to be sorrowful and troubled. When he said to them, my soul is very sorrowful, even to death, remain here and watch with me. And I'm going a little farther, or in going a little farther, he fell on his face and prayed, saying, my father, if it, is possi if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. I, I think in the verses that we're covering tonight, there's just relationship, relationship, relationship. I don't know about you, but when I go through hard things, I want my closest people to go with me. He was close to the 12, yet here he goes to a place that literally means olive press. Gethsemane means olive press. He's going to an olive orchard where they would use the olive press to press the oil out of the olives. And here he's going to go into the garden of Gethsemane, the olive press, and intense, under intense pressure and through the grieving and, and the sorrowful feelings of being troubled almost uh, even to death, he'll end up sweating drops of blood out of his pores. The, the symbolism through this is, is incredible, but the fact that he leaves not, or eight of them to go a little further with his closest three. And it, I don't want to read anything into this, but to look at this and go, that's where he is able to really share his heart 
and show his true emotions. Guys, those things that we don't want to admit that we have, right? I may harp on this too much. I don't know. But we don't like to talk about our emotions. We don't like to process our emotions because we don't know how. Here Jesus is getting the people that are closest to him and going, I am very sorrowful. My soul is very sorrowful even to death. And the request here is that you would remain with me. I don't, I'm just going to go over here and pray, but stay close to me. Watch with me. Spurgeon says this, and again, he chose that garden. He's talking about the Garden of Gethsemane amongst others contiguous with, you know, to Jerusalem because Judas knew the place. He wanted retirement, but he did not want a place where he could skulk and hide himself. It was not for Christ to give himself up that were uh, that would be like suicide. But it was not for him to withdraw and, and screet himself that were like cowardice. So he went to a place that would be familiar. Soon Jesus would feel that, that intense pressure that I mentioned earlier. Here he is leaving the company of the eleven to go be alone. He took his three that he could share his true feelings with and then he went to be with the one the father who knew him best who knew everything he was going through because he's the one that had called him and as stressed out as he was he allowed the the authority in the, his love for the father to trump any temptations he might have had to start insisting on his own will This phrase, my soul is very sorrowful, even to death. Jesus was distressed at the spiritual horror of waiting for him, waiting for him on the cross. Jesus would stand in the place of guilty sinners and receive all the spiritual punishment sinners deserve. He who knew no sin would be sin for us. Not only this, but more, more so he felt the grief and the horror of what would come, the Father turning his back on him. This request for the cup, if it be possible. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. Here we see Jesus' emotions come through his human nature. His fear of what was coming allowed him to ask the Father, if it be possible. But being God in the flesh, he submitted to the Father. This is a prime example of Jesus learning obedience. I don't know the first time that I heard that and I realized that it blew my mind. I always had it fixed in my head that Jesus knew everything. He was God in the flesh. But he had never been tested to the point to where he had to choose whether he was going to obey or disobey. And in this moment, it was just another opportunity. As Hebrews 5, 8 says, although he was a son, he learned obedience through what he suffered. The cup was commonly used to mean one's lot or experience. He had also just passed a cup that held what symbolized the sacrifice he was going to make. God the Father would never deny the Son any request because Jesus prayed according to the heart and will of the Father. Since Jesus drank the cup of judgment at the cross, we know that it is not possible for salvation to come any other way. Salvation by the work of Jesus at the cross is the only possible way. If there is any other way to be made right before God, then Jesus died an unnecessary death. Why do I mention that? It's because there are churches out there today teaching that you can get to heaven without Jesus. That he is not, as he said in his word, the way, the truth, and the life. There are other ways, and that's just flat heresy. That's why I, I do my best to try and stick to God's word in nothing but God's word. Verse 40. And he came to the disciples and found them sleeping, and he said to Peter, So could you not watch with me for one hour? Watch and pray that you may not enter into temptation. 
The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. Again, for a second time, he went away and prayed, Father, if, it is, if this cannot pass unless I drink it, your will be done. And again, he came and found them sleeping, for their eyes were heavy. So leaving them again, he went away and prayed for the third time, saying the same words again. Then he came to the disciples and said, Sleep and take your rest later on. See, the hour is at hand, and the Son of Man is betrayed unto the hands of sinners. Rise, let us be going. See, my betrayer is at hand. Jesus comes back seeking companionship from his closest disciples, only to find them asleep. And I honestly, I don't think that he was so frustrated that they actually fell asleep. I think that, that the sleep was just one way of realizing that they didn't fully grasp the, the magnitude of the situation. I don't know about you, but when I've got something coming up or some intense thing is about to happen, I can't hardly go to sleep. And that's just with fishing and hunting. Like if I'm getting ready for a trip, I can't hardly go to sleep the night before. It's kind of sad. But here, he would, you would expect these disciples to understand what he's saying. I'm going to die. I'm going to be betrayed. You're going to fall away from me. You're going to desert me. And that, that didn't even trouble them enough to keep them up. Here, Jesus warns them again, stating, Watch and pray that you may not enter into temptation the spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. I just have to drive home, guys. This is why we need to be on our knees before the Father every day, going, God, help me, because my flesh just wants what it wants. And my spirit is weak, but I need you to take over. That's it, inviting the Holy Spirit. Take control of my life, my eyes, my mind, my tongue, my ears, my feet, my hands. Help me to not go places I don't need to go and help me to not do things I don't need to do or say things I don't need to say or think things I don't need to think. Unless we are inviting him to take control of our, our faculties, every part of it, then what are we left up to do? We're, we're left up to what we learned and our ability to apply it on our own. And I don't know about you, but that's not enough for me. I just fail too often if I do that. He says again, uh, asking the Father, if this cannot pass unless I drink it, your will be done. He's accepting fully the truth that he must drink in order to fulfill the will of the Father. It's the reminder to you and me that because of our sin, and not just our sin, not just the actions that we carry out, but the fact that I have a sinful heart and a sin nature that causes me to sin, I need to, to be saved from that sin and have my life transformed. And that starts with the blood of Jesus being shed on our behalf to cover our sin. And then the Holy Spirit coming into us to transform who we are. He's accepting the, that full responsibility. Something the Father was had laid out that this is what you're going to do. And he accepted it. Look at... I think I read this last week, but I wanted to read it again because it drives home this truth. Isaiah 53, 10 through 12, it says, Yet it was the will of the Father to crush him. He, was, he has put him to grief. When his soul makes an offering for guilt, he shall see his offspring. He shall prolong his days. The will of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. Out of the anguish of his soul, he shall see and be satisfied. By his knowledge, all the righteous one, or shall, sorry, by his knowledge shall the righteous one, my servant, make many to be counted righteous. That's you and me. If you're a believer here tonight, that's us. And it's Jesus that did it. And he shall bear their iniquities. Therefore, I will divide him a portion with the many, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he poured out his soul to death and was numbered with the transgressors. Yet, he bore the sin of many and makes intercession for the transgressors. Carson said this, Jesus did not die as a martyr. Jesus went to his death knowing that it was his Father's will that he faced death completely alone. 
as the sacrificial, wrath-averting Passover lamb. As his death was unique, so also his anguish and our best response to it. Our best response to it is hushed worship. As we reflect on the truth of the scripture and how it applies to our lives, it's not enough just to know what happened. It's not enough just to know who Jesus is. It's like, okay, God, what do you want me to do with this? We forget that it's not just, Jesus is not just our Savior. He's also our example. If you remember Paul in his letters to the Corinthians and to the Ephesians, to the Romans, imitate me as I imitate Christ. Christ is our example. What can we glean from this and apply to our lives? These should be attributes of our own character, our own faith. First of all, he submitted to the Father's will. Do we wake up every morning going, Lord, not my will, but yours be done? That sounds familiar, right? That's in the Lord's Prayer. That's why he says it, because we should desire. We, he wants us to desire that God's will would be done in my own life first, so that it can be done out in this world. So submitting to the Father's will, going, Lord, I'm going to live for you, and whatever you want me to do, I'll do it. It doesn't matter. It is is (laughs) that moment. I don't know how many of you have actually come to that moment where you said that, but I remember the day that I did it, and I remember how freeing it was. It sounds like slavery and bondage, but it's absolute freedom. He also gives us the example that we should show our love for the Father through our obedience. That's what Jesus did here. By saying, not my will, but yours, I'll I'll do what you've asked me to do. I'll, I'll carry out this job that you've assigned for me to do. And John 15 says that we show our obedience. We show our love to the Father through our obedience. Third, that we not only accept that suffering is coming, coming, but expect it and welcome it. Any of you ready to jump up and raise your hand and say, I'll do that? It doesn't sound too fun, right? Suffering. The old adage that you're either in suffering or you were just, or you're coming out of suffering or you're about to go into suffering. Like I said earlier, suffering is part of God testing your faith to where if you lean into him and trust him in it, You'll see how he gets you through it, and he'll grow you in it. And the expected part and welcome it part is really the simple fact that if we're experiencing suffering, it's because God is somehow in, in our life getting glory from what we're doing. The fact that we face trials in our marriages is not just because we're married to a sinner, It's because if we're living our lives out and our marriages out for the Lord, then Satan's going to hate that and he's going to want to attack it. And it's going to tick him off and he's going to start sifting us like wheat if the Lord allows it. And he wants to grow us through that. So we should expect it and go, thank you, Lord. I must be doing something right. Help me to get through this. Because I don't know what the other side's going to look like. Lastly, We should learn that we do all of this in order to glorify the Father and so prove to be a disciple of Jesus Christ. If you've asked yourself or or anybody asked you, what is the meaning of life? There's been movies made about it, not so good movies. The whole purpose of our existence on this earth is is to bring God glory. So, well, Peter, but I like to live for myself. Yeah, so do I. <laughs> uh, but it doesn't last very long, and it's not very satisfying, and I always find myself just wishing I had done what the Lord wanted me to do. So the more we learn that it's all about God getting glory, I was talking to Brian about this today. Y'all might get sick and tired of hearing my testimony. I don't know. But my testimony and your testimony is not your story and it's not my story. 
It's God's story. About what he did through you and in you and through me and in me. And so for me to not tell that story is robbing God of glory. So if there's any <clears throat> if there's any reason why I tell it so many times, first it may encourage somebody, but also it gives God glory. First John three sixteen says this by this we know love, that he laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for the brothers. I'm gonna end with this. It's a quote from Carson. It says not your will but mine changed paradise to desert. Did you catch that? Not your will but mine <laughs> changed paradise to desert and brought man from Eden to Gethsemane. Now, not my will but yours brings anguish to the man who prays it and transforms the desert into the kingdom and brings man from Gethsemane to the gates of glory. And that's Jesus' example to us. Not my will, but yours. My prayer for this church is that we would, we would embrace that more and more every day. We would realize that it's his will that's best. He knows us best. He knows and has a plan for us. 